If I could have everyone's, Jamie, turn the um, sound on. So, you know, just explaining that. If I could have everyone's attention, if be seated and quiet down just a little bit, please. Thank you. Well, welcome to our Henry County Board of Commissioners call budget workshop. I'd like to call a meeting to order and have uh, Bernita to come forward and make the, begin the presentation. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners, and Henry County community. Today we will go through our FY25 proposed general fund budget. I ask that you let me uh, go ahead and go through the uh, pr presentation, and if you could please hold all of your questions until the end, and let me just go ahead and get through the presentation first. Um, I will begin by reminding the board of our general budget philosophy. This philosophy has been incorporated into each annual budget. The tenets of that philosophy is to maintain the current millage rate of 12.733 mills, offer fair and competitive salaries and benefits for our employees, advance board priorities and strategic partnerships, and fund department essentials to maintain current service levels for Henry County residents. Our goal is to create a balanced budget utilizing available revenues to fund projected expenditures and to not build our budget based on utilizing fund balance to fund recurring operations. For the last six years, we have held true to this philosophy, all while the county's millage rate remained unchanged at 12.733 mills. Let, let me repeat that. Our millage rate has remained unchanged at 12.733 mills. During this time, we have found ways to increase service levels for Henry County residents. We have done several improvements and beautifications to county parks, we have added over 100 plus public safety personnel to respond to calls and keep this growing and thriving Henry County community safe. In 2020, we built fire station number eight. In 2023, we purchased and renovated the new elections facility, just to name a few, all funded by the general fund. The FY25 Proposed general fund budget is $259.7 million, which is $20.7 million higher, or an 8.7% year-over-year increase, compared to the FY24 revised budget of $238.9 million. Some of the major items included in the proposed budget are $4.3 million for pension funding and insurance increases, $4 million for employee colon longevity, $1.4 million for debt payments, $1.3 million funding for resurfacing, $1.2 million increase for inmate medical and food cost, $412,000 for countywide technology <coughs> service contract increases, $446,000 increased translator indigent, indigent defense and court reporter cost, and $1.6 million for all other essential departmental costs and contractual cost increases. Mm 
Here you have a comparison of the original request we received on the left compared to the items being recommended for inclusion and approval in the FY25 budget on the right. As you can see by looking at line 17 in the far right column under the recommended column, $259.7 million is very different from the original request that we received from the departments, which would have put our general fund budget at $271.5 million. The budget that we are proposing of $259.7 million is what we need to keep service levels where they are currently. Some items of note, this budget does not assume adding any new personnel. However, it does have all of the current vacancies funded and included in this budget. Now let us talk about the revenue assumptions that have been included in this budget. The proposed budget assumes that we will have modest increases in property tax growth in FY25 of 4.5%, not the normal double-digit growth that we have previously seen, which is normally a mix of inflationary and real growth. Some of the drivers to this decrease are the increase in home prices compared to previous years. Residential markets appear to be stabilizing, and home mortgage interest rates appear to be a major factor. We are continuing to see growth in the industrial and commercial sectors. Another major assumption that we must discuss surrounds our sales tax revenue. Due to the changes in some buyers' habits, meaning they are pr preferring to do more shopping online versus shopping in store, we are beginning to see our sales tax revenue begin to stabilize. A revenue category that once provided anywhere from 5 to 7 percent year-over-year growth has now begun to stabilize and even begun to show some signs of decline. Therefore, we are not expecting any year-over-year -year growth in this revenue category. Because those two revenue categories account for more than 72% of our general fund revenue, we are projecting general fund revenue at $251.5 million currently. Now that we have covered the assumptions included in the FY25 proposed budget, let us review the constraints for the proposed budget. The largest and most ominous constraint is the frozen homestead exemption. In 2023 alone, the county lost $34 million due to the frozen homestead exemption. Since 2018, the county has lost $82 million in revenue that could have been added, that could have been used to do so many things for a growing county that has so many needs, both operationally and capital. The amounts I just quoted are the financial impacts of new homeowners coming online each year, beginning to receive the frozen exemption. Just think, if this were removed and no longer applied to new homeowners moving into the county, what type of financial impact this would be. Other items viewed as constraints. The cost of services is increasing without a corresponding increase in revenue. Contract costs are constantly rising for the county, but our revenues are not increasing at the same pace. We have had several discussions about our building needs for our courts, the jail, the public safety training facility, the E911 EMA building, and the Tax Commissioner's Locust Grove Satellite Office. However, we are not setting aside any funding for future debt service payments. Based upon meetings that we have had with our financial advisors Davenport, we need to begin to set aside any excess revenue from the general fund to pay for the debt service beginning in FY25 and increasing through FY28. As I mentioned earlier, the proposed budget of $259.7 million is just to maintain the current service levels. However, it does not fully address constituent concerns surrounding public safety, specifically fire and police and code enforcement. These three departments make up 39% of our general fund budget. Some of the concerns expressed are, the public wants to ensure that these departments have competitive salaries so that they can attract and retain quality staff. The public wants to ensure that these departments can be fully staffed to appropriately respond to calls, ensure the equipment is up to date and appropriate based on the locale. For example, the equipment fits the local businesses nearby, such as warehouses, interstates, homes, etc and the jail facilities can accommodate a growing population and that it can be adequately staffed and secured. The only way to address these concerns is by increasing the public safety millage currently being charged on the property tax bills for fire and police. 
Let us begin by defining public safety. Based on the 2020 service delivery strategy agreement between the county and the four cities, Hampton, Locust Grove, Stockbridge, and McDonough, police and fire have been separated out into their own service districts, as this is a distinct service that is to be provided by each city and or the county dependent upon the locale. Cities will provide services within their incorporated boundaries and the county will provide the services within the unincorporated areas of Henry County. Some may be asking, why have we not mentioned the sheriff in this public safety discussion? According to the official code of Georgia annotated, Title 33, Chapter 8-8.3, Chanel versus Houston, a special service district cannot be created for the sheriff's office. This arrangement is intended to avoid double taxing municipalities. According to the SDS agreement, the sheriff provides services to the entire county and as such should not be separated into a service district. <clears throat> Next, you see the submitted FY25 budget request that these three departments submitted. The total of the request is $23.6 million in operational and capital requests. Due to the amount of these requests and the constraints previously discussed, we were unable to address most of these requests. You can see that the largest requests are capital and vehicle needs for the fire department, totaling $16.7 million. Over the past several months, we have had several discussions with the board about the public safety needs, including the need for a fire training facility located in Henry County, a new E911 EMA facility, a court expansion, a new jail pod, and other county facility needs. This slide lays out the project plans and phases by fiscal years and the projected cost of each project. Most of those public safety projects mentioned are expected to occur in phase one and phase two, which you can see on the chart above, indicated by the blue and yellow highlights, blue for phase one and yellow for phase two. Looking at this page, you will see that just for phase one, we are projecting that those projects are going to cost about $94.7 million. Those will be bonded through our public facility authority. We expect to close on that in September 2024, and our first debt payment will be due July 2025. Phase two projects are projected to cost about $116 million. We are projecting a September 2026 closing with debt payments beginning in July 2027. Those projects are expected to be complete in about 2030. Commissioners, in your review packet, I have included six exhibits that walk you through the detailed calculations. If you recall, during our local option sales tax negotiations with the cities in 2022, it was noted that our service districts, specifically police and fire, were not self-supporting as they should be, and we were allowing our general funds to subsidize them. In order to make them self-supporting, we now have to shift a portion of the millage from the general fund to the fire and police service districts, as well as increase the millage rate. Due to the complexity of the calculations, we will not cover those exhibits in detail during this presentation. However, commissioners, if you have questions, I will be happy to meet with you after today's meeting to discuss. Our overall proposal is to increase the millage from 12.733 mills to 14.658 mills. This is a 1.925 mil increase. We have discussed this proposed increase with the tax commissioner's office, and we believe this is the best approach. While a 1.975 mil increase is desired based on the following, we need $8.2 million to meet current county service levels. This equates to 0.71 mils as indicated by the blue box above. We usually like to have two years of debt service set aside. The first year of debt service for phase one projects due in 2025 is $5.8 million. This equates to 0.5 mils. The second year of debt service due in 2026 is $9 million. This equates to 0.77 mils. The total of all three equals 1.98 mils. With the proposed 1.925 mil increase, we will be able to have each service district be self-supporting in accordance with our SDS agreement. We can, meet, we can meet basic county service levels and we can set aside the first year of debt service payments. With an increased millage, we can now work toward our 2026 and future commitments.
To give everyone an idea of the financial impact the proposed millage increase will have on them, we worked with the tax commissioner's office to create mock tax bills based on a $300,000 home with and without homestead exemption and a mock tax bill for a $500,000 home with and without homestead exemption. The frozen exemption amount assumed is $50,000. Of course, this will vary based upon when the person filed for the homestead exemption and who filed and the age of person. So here we're assuming uh, the frozen exemption amount is $50,000. So the first example that you see, uh, example one, this is for a $300,000 home without the frozen exemption. This is the first box on the left. This is taxed at the current millage rate of 12.733 mills. The tax bill is $4,332. On the right, the same $300,000 home without the frozen exemption taxed at the new millage rate of 14.658 mills. The tax bill is $4,535. The increase is $202. <clears throat> The next example is that same $300,000 home with the, with the frozen exemption, taxed at 12.733 mills. The tax bill is $3,596. And on the bottom right, this $300,000 home with the frozen exemption, taxed at the new tax rate of 14.658 mills. The tax bill is $3,702, and the increase is $106 for the year. Example three, this is a $500,000 home uh, up in the upper left-hand corner. This is without the frozen exemption, taxed at 12.733 mills, the current rate. The tax bill is $7,401. Uh, over in the right-hand corner, the same home taxed at the new tax, the proposed tax rate of 14.658 mills. The tax bill is $7,758. The increase is $356. The bottom right, example four, the $500,000 home with the frozen exemption taxed at 12.733 mills. The tax bill is $6,665. On the bottom right, with the frozen exemption taxed at the proposed rate of 14.658 mills, the tax bill would be $6,000. $925 and the increase would be $260. So this is just kind of a comparison to see what the um, proposed increase would look like, um, you know, for an average price of a home in the area. So I will pause now and take any questions that you may have. and you had the desired. Um, so I guess the reasoning been behind not going to the desired as opposed to the proposed. Um, well, the, we were trying to keep it, not take it up too high. And um, so we were trying to keep it below, you know, not take it up too high. I guess. So, okay. And, and just, I, I know you, and I'm glad you put the slide in here showing the $300,000 home and the $500,000 home and what that yearly increase would be. So, um, and just, just breaking it down for all of us, all of us are taxpayers, but you know, most of the time it looks like it's about a 20, 20 to the $30 increase per month uh, on a tax bill. And um, I know j just as a, as a taxpayer, it's, it's hard to talk about adding taxes. It is, it's, it's extremely hard. Um, but as you can see, anybody who follows the county and, and what we do on a daily basis, and, and I always try to compare it to, to you know, a simple thing like going to the grocery store, um, we, we see the price inc increases with everything that we're doing. So the same thing that we see at the grocery store, just in our regular shopping, it's the same thing with the county government. Everything that we do costs more than it did just two or three years ago. Um, so sometimes we'll, you'll hear a word like surplus and you mean 
and you think it means extra, I'm like, there, there really is no extra. Um, we're trying to, to be solvent, trying to maintain a healthy budget, trying to maintain a healthy reserve um, and be fiscally responsible, but we, we still have to provide services to our citizens. What most citizens don't know, and I, I really don't think we talk about it enough, is um, the county actually, um, we pay more for services provided than taxpayers pay in. So for every dollar that a taxpayer pays to the county, the county provides a dollar and 40 cents in services. So for every home in the county, the county actually loses, loses money on the dollar. And we, we don't really talk about it enough. I, I try to tell people that. Um, and people are surprised, and there may be some people in this room that are surprised, but we, we don't, we don't make what we put out. <laughs> Definitely. So um, when we have these, and this is a hard conversation to have when you start talking about taxes, um, but it's a necessary conversation. If, if we are to be able to keep up our service levels as a county, um, this is a conversation we have to have. To have. Uh, right now it's a conversation, it's a workshop, and, and we will need public input, but I just wanted to uh, just talk about those items. Thank you. Thank you, all. Just one quick question. I know the previous, the millage rate that we currently have, the 12.733, has been unchanged for six years. What was the millage rate prior to us changing it six years ago? It was 14.9. I think the highest has been 14.75. Yes, 14.75 was the highest that it's been. Thank you. And so to answer your question, when you asked me about why did we not go up any higher, that's why we wanted to keep it at the 14.658. We didn't want to take it up any higher than it had previously been, so we were trying to be mindful of that when we proposed the 1.925 increase. So, so I, know, of course, I know previously there had been some discussion about creating um, a public safety meal and it looks like we have gotten away from that discussion and we're talking about just a general uh, meal increase. Is, is this for this public safety? Yes, this, this okay. is for public safety. So it was a breakout about capital in there. Uh, is that capital for public safety? Because, you know, I, I, I guess I just want to make sure that, that what we're talking about is for public safety and it will not be utilized in the general fund or any other uh, funds that would be any other budgetary um, needs that we have that this strictly goes to public safety? Yes, ma'am. So any um, additional dollars that would be generated in those service districts, we would only be able to use them towards um, fire and police related activities. That's what it can only be used towards. Okay. We can't apply them anywhere else. Okay. And, and so, um, you know, I know that uh, from a standpoint of, from the fire side of it, I know that we are behind on the number of fire stations that we need to have in the county. Um, it takes equipment. Uh, we can build a station, but we still got to put trucks and equipment in them. And um, we want to make sure that we can keep our ISO ratings down so uh, citizens are not paying higher insurance premiums. And so um, I know that there has been, is, is Chief Burnett here? I know that there has been a lot of discussion with regards to the need of fire. Uh, and I'd like to ask Chief Burnett to come forward and just kind of talk a little bit about where we are and where we need to be uh, with regards to fire services.
Good afternoon, Commissioner, board members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to conversate real quick. Um, I would like to say that um, we've talked about the growth of the county and, and the experiences that everybody's facing. Of course, it's no different with us either. Um, the last time we added additional resources to the fire service was in 2018. That was the last additional fire station that was built. Everything that's been built since then has been replacement stations. They've been replacement stations uh, and replacement of vehicles. We've added no new additional services um, to the fire service whatsoever. The, the concern and the challenge with that, of course, with, with us is just like, you know, Commissioner Lewis mentioned with everything else, it's the cost of doing business is, is getting higher, right? And that cost of doing business for us is the increase in the call volume. Year over year for us, we experience the same thing uh, as Ms. Campbell mentioned, which is roughly, you know, a five to six percent, sometimes seven percent. It was a little outlier during COVID, you know, went up to about 15 percent. But on average, we increase call volume uh, or demand of services about five to six percent uh, year over year. So if you just take from 2018 to this year, you know, that's six years on an average of five percent. means we're 30 percent busier now today than we were in 2018, but we haven't added any additional resources, you know, to keep up with that. Uh, you have mentioned, the, the training center has been mentioned a few times, uh, and, and you're absolutely correct. Henry County has never built a training facility for the fire service. Uh, what we've built uh, in the past has just been on basically on the, on the backs of, you know, some volunteers who were willing to come out and donate some time to weld a couple metal boxes together. So we've never built a training facility for the fire service, as you've mentioned. So, you know, we need that to attract those new personnel. You know, we're, we're training out of a building uh, that was condemned for a few years, you know, that we've had to reopen to find a place to put some classrooms, you know. So those things are, are definitely challenges to us, um, you know, as, we've, as we continue to move forward. Uh, and as we've had many conversations about, you know, how far behind we are. Uh, it is a, a big fear of mine and a concern um, when you mentioned the ISO rating, that we are going to lose our ISO rating next year. We have to be evaluated every five years. Our next evaluation is due in 2025. Uh, and there's a high possibility that we're going to lose the current rating that we have, which means the insurance premiums are going to go up a little bit. Uh, but that's due to, you know, the growth of the county that's experienced since 2020. You know, the evaluation comes in 2025. And then some of the challenges we've had since our last evaluation in 2020, such as having to shut down the current training facility that we've had. Um, you know, those things and, and then not keeping up with the growth as far as, you know, adding that new additional equipment that you mentioned, adding those additional stations, um, those are challenges to us, right? And then, you know, our next evaluation is due in 2030. As we mentioned in the retreat, though, you know, there's an opportunity year over year when you continue to add additional services for that, that we could reevaluate. We could call those that company back in, reevaluate us, you know, and then hopefully lower that service back down. Uh, so those definitely are some challenges. I hope they answer any questions, but I'll be more than happy to, to answer anything specific. Any questions from, from the board? Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. And then I know from our police standpoint, I know call volume has increased. Um, I don't know, Director Ammerman or, or Deputy Chief Bolton, um, can, can one of you all come forward and talk to us a little bit about where we are from the uh, police side? Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, just like Commissioner Lewis, I mean, you, you, you've said it all. Um, the county continues to grow and prices keep going up. Um, and Chair asked me to track, you know, what's being built so I can give her some insight of what's going on. Since she's asked me to do that, the county has approved 8,719 8 dwellings. Um, with that, that's what's already been approved to date, right, as of January 1st of this year. That's going to take another 51 police officers to do that. And what current costs are to outfit them and do that, that's another $8 million. That's what you've already built and what I'm behind. Now, what's about to get approved, what's pending, is another 10,000 residents. That equates to a need in another 62 officers. That's another $10 million. So you guys know what you're approving. You, you see the growth. You see everything. 
we, if we don't keep up with it, then we're going to be in big trouble, just like fire is right now, trying to play catch up. And, you know, every chief came up here and talked about all the things he's replaced. And we haven't got ahead of the game at all. Even though call volume's gone up 30%, in the last six years, we haven't given them anything new to, to fight that with. PD last year, their call volume went up. Even though Stockbridge has taken over, you would think, yeah, you know, calls will go down. No, we're up 27% in call volume. It's not stopping. And if we don't keep up with it, we're going to be in big trouble. Thank you. Oh, did any board members have any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, there's one thing I do want to say uh, in your, as a part of your exhibits, I do want to make one point clear. Um, if you'll note on the general fund in each one of your exhibits, the general fund millage, you'll note uh, we did reduce the general fund millage down from 8.055 down to the 6.229 mills just to help adequately fund the fire and police uh, service districts. Um, as an additional way to help fund the fire and police service districts. So I just wanted to make that point, um, make sure everyone knew that point. So as far as next steps, uh, we will hold our uh, first public hearing on May 7th, 2024 at 9 a.m. And then our second public hearing and the adoption of the final FY25 budget will be May 21st to 2024 at 6.30 p.m. during our regularly scheduled board meeting. And there we will ask the Board of Commissioners to vote to approve our um, FY25 budget. And I guess one of the things, I just want to make sure that uh, um, the Financial Services Department, uh, please take the time to meet with uh, the, each commissioner individually uh, for those that you all have not met with. So that way, if there's any uh, questions, concerns, or anything that, um, you know, they can, you'll be able to explain and address it at that particular time. Um, I guess one other thing is, and I guess this would be something for the county manager to, uh, to, to maybe talk about, is that, um, even though all of our cities have their own police department, we still provide backup services. And then we provide fire services uh, to all the cities. I know that McDonough has their fire department, but we still provide services, backup services to them as well. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how that works in our SDS agreements and um, you know, the, the cost that it, that it is, the cost burden that it does put on us uh, from the county aspect of it. Absolutely, Chair. And I'm going to ask Chief Burnett to return to the podium because I want to give a real life example um, of a situation that happened, I think, two Fridays ago, um, right behind the administration building to really start the conversation, but to specifically address your question, we have service delivery strategy that's in place for all of our services that the county government provides, specifically for police services and fire. Right now, um, if we are dispatched to assist a city, whether it's on the fire or on the police side, the county does not invoice the city for those services. We just automatically provide that follow-up to them. And so one of the things that we've noticed is there has been an uptick um, in the number of calls that we're responding to, whether it be in the unincorporated area or the cities. And I do know at the time that we were discussing our service delivery strategy, there had been some conversation about those special services. For example, if the cities needed a um, dive team, because none of the cities have a dive team through the fire department, or if the SWAT team needed to respond, um, should we invoice for those? And so that is something that we will certainly start looking at and tracking. Um, but I want Chief Burnett to speak to the fire on this past Friday. I believe it was the Crossings um, apartment unit. And I don't know if Tamika may be able to add, but you may be able to tell us how many units actually responded on scene. And this was actually an apartment fire in the city limits of McDonough. 
Yes, ma'am. So the, the, what she's talking about is we have a, what's called an, an automatic slash mutual aid agreement with the city of McDonough. Um, a mutual aid agreement, the difference in those two, a mutual aid agreement means that there's a request for help. So another jurisdiction reaches out uh, through the 911 channels most of the time uh, and asks if we are available to assist with help, as we do other jurisdictions sometimes as well. Um, and, but with McDonald, we have what's called an automatic slash mutual aid agreement, which means that when a 911 call comes in and there's an emergency uh, specifically in a jurisdiction, then the aid that is sent to assist is automatic. There's no request for help through 911 system or from chief to chief. It's something that's automatically generated. For example, you might have on a, a city county boundary line, a McDonough station might be closer to a residence, let's say. Um, than a county fire station is. So the McDonough station would respond into the county district uh, and the same thing vice versa. There might be a county station closer to a city district line of McDonough and a county station would come into the city just because that response jurisdiction is closer, right? So that's what the automatic aid part is for. Another prime example um, of that would be uh, in Locust Grove area, for example. Butts County has a fire station that's you know, less than a, a half a mile from the county line, our closest station to the county line at the tip of Locust Grove uh, is about nine miles away. So they're closer, so if a call came out right on the inside of the Henry County line, we would call Butts County and say, hey, can you send that fire station just simply because help could get there faster. The call specifically that county manager is mentioning um, was an apartment fire uh, about two weeks ago that required about 17, I think, uh, total fire units to respond on, on the scene. And of course, the majority of those uh, responding units being county units. Um, the city of McDonough has two fire stations to cover the in, entire city of McDonough. They're roughly a little over 20 square miles, uh, and each one of their stations covers you know, roughly 10-ish square miles or so, and they do that most of the time out of two engines per day uh, and then a, a ladder truck. For example, when you have a regular house fire, let's say come out, just a regular residential house fire, the responding units um, that typically is sent is three engines, one ladder truck, one heavy squad, two ambulances, a battalion chief, and a shift commander. And then an apartment fire on that particular call Automatically, right off the bat, there's four engines that go, singular ladder truck, you know, uh, another response vehicle, a couple of uh, rescues. But then, typically, when they responding units get there and they had the size fire that they had the other night, they call for what uh, we refer to as a second alarm, which means you basically double the entire response of the first alarm and then you times it two and you ask for all that help again. Right? So you can imagine how those draining of resources start compiling uh, quickly. And that's the call that she's referencing you know, to the other night. Um, whereas you know, we, we put roughly you know, 90 to 100 people on shift a day, excuse me, Donald puts you know, uh, 12 you know, per day. So you know, the, help, the help is there for the citizens because we want the closest person to go. You know, I, I completely understand that uh, and respect that, don't get me wrong. Um, but the help is definitely more heavy sided one direction than it is the other. And I hope that answers the county manager's question. Thank you. Can I ask a question yeah. before you sit down? Um, can you talk about the impact of I 75 on your service, service delivery? Sure. Um, and the, the other piece, too, that, that we haven't been mentioned yet is when we, when we say fire, um, let's not forget that you know, we're encompassing the, the EMS response for that as well. Mm -hmm. So while the city of McDonough does have their own fire department and they're responsible you know, from the state for them being the authority having jurisdiction for their square miles, the county is still responsible on the EMS side for the entire 327 square miles of the county. So that's, uh, and that is in encompassed uh, in, in the fire service. We just kind of, you know, both of those together. Um, I-75 obviously generates, uh, you know, a huge response for us uh, and, and the need uh, for certain types of vehicles such as we asked for this morning during, you know, the commissioner's meeting. Um, the interstate, and if you've never done it, the interstate, quite frankly, is one of the most dangerous places uh, that, we can, that we can work. 
Uh, everybody's driven on the interstate. Everybody knows, you know, the amount of traffic that we have. Everybody knows that we're the Bermuda Triangle of I-75 because there's just traffic that backs up for no reason. Uh, you can be anywhere else in the country and you say we're I-75 stops and they know exactly, you know, where you're at, right? Um, but that's one of the most dangerous places that we can work. So when we have a call on the interstate, typically we send extra units, not only just for simply having the extra hands to help, but we can have extra units on scene to block traffic for the units that are specifically working there. Uh, while it might sound simple, you know, just a little fender bender that pulls off to the side of the road, you would think, ah, nobody's really hurt that bad. Let's just send a single amb ambulance out there to check. But if you've never witnessed another car coming up 80 miles an hour and running into those vehicles, you know, then it's something to see, right? So we send extra units to help block off um, those roads. The tankers that we specifically asked for this morning with all the warehouse being dealt, that's obviously attracting a lot more tractor trailer traffic for us, right? Tractor trailers bring uh, all kinds of stuff in the back of them that we don't know what they are. Um, and with there being no water on the interstate, you know, we have to have those additional units uh, to provide water for us. I think we made mention a few times before in the past there was uh, the lithium ion battery fire in Locust Grove, I-75 northbound. Shut traffic down for about eight hours. Got many phone calls, you know, from the county manager. What's going on with that? Why are we still about there? Why are we still busy? You know, there were like 12 little cordless drill batteries, lithium ion batteries. That took thousands and thousands and thousands upon uh, gallons of water to try to extinguish before we could move it off to the side of the road to a safe place and then continue in extinguishing it, right? Um, but those are the types of challenges that we're facing, you know, up and down 75 every single day. Thank you, sir. And then, Lord forbid, we have a hazmat spill. So we have, a, we have a, what's called a, a type two hazmat FEMA response team. Uh, and we have that um, because that's industry driven. Commissioner mentioned, you know, what the, the residents charge and then, or how the residents affect and then how that, the industry affects. 99% of the hazmat calls that we have in the county are industry driven. There's very few that happen, you know, typically at residents. Most of them are industry driven. That's why we have the level of response team we have is because of all the industry that we have in the county. If we didn't have that, uh, quite frankly, some of the industry that we have here, they would be looking other places to go because they, they have to have, per the state, per the federal guidelines, they have to have what's called in a response team. And they use the fire department as their response team if the fire department provides that level of service. If the fire department doesn't provide that level of service to them, then they have to train their own people and generate their own internal response team. We provide that service to them, which is an attractive to them. They end up saving money because they don't have to have the equipment or train the people on staff themselves. Their response plan is call 911 because we provide that service. If we didn't, quite frankly, it would drive some of that business, you know, away from us. Commissioner Wilson. Since the SDS, the city of McDonough has increased their multifamilies tremendously. So would the city administrator, which is the former fire chief of the McDonald Fire, do y'all have a conversation how that's going to increase your call volume? No, sir. Uh, and, and that's quite frankly with what the cities have done over the past couple of years. Uh, I don't get I don't get notified of any you know anything that's going on in the city. Uh, I found out that Locust Grove is getting a, an EV plant uh, by Twitter. I think it was you know, but. However, I'm still responsible for responding to each one of those cities and providing those services. Um, so I, I, don't get a, I don't get notified, we don't get notified, we don't get a say so uh, of what's going on inside the cities, but we are expected to respond and make sure that that problem goes away uh, when something bad does happen. Thank you. And if you'll recall, commissioners, during the legislative um, briefing with our delegation, um, I know this is a budget meeting, but I think it's important to reiterate the concerns we've had with the cities that have their own fire marshals and us not receiving plans or being made aware of fires in situations or buildings that we're going to have to respond to. So every opportunity that I get, I want to make sure that we continue having that conversation um, because it's not a matter of the county not wanting the cities to 
do their stuff. But if we're being asked to respond, if we're being asked to show up on scene, then we need to know when we get there what we're going into. And I think it's a simple ask, you know, let us know when development plans come in, let us have an opportunity to review them so that when we show up, there are five hydrants, there's adequate water flow, there's lines in place for us to be able to do what we need to do. So this is, I certainly don't want it to appear that we're coming down on the cities, but all of this conversation really leads back to the budget and the things that we're having to do at a county level to make sure that we're taking care of every resident, whether they're in the unincorporated area or the city limits. And I think that's important um, for you all to know, to continue knowing about, um, because it's not slowing down. And when those calls come, we have to respond. And our team isn't looking at jurisdictional boundaries. We're looking at how are we gonna save lives and what do we need to do? And so, I know the budget conversation is a painful conversation because it is a big number. Um, you know, Commissioner Lewis asked the question, you know, what's the difference between the recommended and the desired? We want the desired, but we also know that that desire comes out of costs, a price tag, and that price tag is increasing property taxes so that we can pay for that piece of it. And so we need to know from you all um, what your priorities are. We've talked about it. But we really, really need to know, you know, one of the slots that Bernita put up was pension and insurance. Those are things that we have to know. We can't wait until May 7th, which is that first public hearing, because we've got to have a budget to present to you all. So, Chair Harrell, I certainly want to make sure that we can, we're continuing this dialogue and at least giving us some ideas so that this team can start building out what that final budget looks like. If the 259 is not the number, then we need to know what you all want to see in this budget so that we can make sure that we've included it. But I think the staff has done a great job providing you all with that initial information and specifically the public safety piece because that is what we hear a lot about, public safety and infrastructure. This board took a bold step in the mid-year budget adjustment to amend our DOT budget to put additional funding in there so that we can get projects moving. But we got a lot, we have a lot that we've got to get accomplished. And this board has been very intentional about making sure that we're following those strategic goals and things that you all have identified, but it comes at a cost. And the unfortunate part is we're having to recommend looking at a millage increase during the budget because we approve our budget before we set our millage rate. And what I don't wanna do is approve a budget and then when we have our millage rate conversation, have to come back and say, well, don't forget you all approved the budget and now you're forced to have to increase the millage rate. Uh, and and I, I thank you and appreciate those those comments. And you know, at the end of the day, um, public safety is number. I mean, is 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 no um, disrespect to the other departments that we have in the county, but our residents are are calling public safety every day. You know, um, we can tell by the call volume. Is Tamika here from 911? Come on up here, uh, Tamika, because you all, you all are doing 911 for, for the entire county. So you're doing 911 for the municipalities as well as the county. And I know that your call volume has increased tremendously. It has. I think it went up. We're at a little over 400,000. Uh, for the year, for 2023. 400,000 calls. Over 400,000 calls received into our 911 center. So think about that, 400,000. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot of calls. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when people pick up the phone and dial 911, they want you to answer. Absolutely. And they Every want time. you to respond. They do. And they want PD to respond. And they want Quickly. EMS to respond. And so, I mean, this is an investment in public safety. Do we want it or we don't? Do we want the quick response time? Do we want additional fire station? Do we want additional police officers on the street? Do we want a safe community? That's really what this all boils down to. Do we want these things? And then, we, you know, even, and, and we don't even want to branch out because the, the more calls they get, the more response that police have to respond. If they're making arrests, then guess where they go? They're going to the courts. 
and, to, and to possibly uh, to the house over there. Uh, and uh, I know the courts, you know, they are bulging at the seams with the number of cases that are coming before them as well. So when we look at public safety in general, police, fire, EMS, EMA, 911, our courts, our jails, um, all of that uh, is a huge expense to the county. And so we do appreciate what public safety and when I, when I talk about public safety, I'm talking about it uh, in totality, including our judicial center and, 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 and everything, because it's, it's interconnected. And, um, you know, we have to figure out a way to pay for it. So, uh, Commissioner. I know you said that there were four hundred calls. Do you have an idea of how much, on the average, each call costs the county? Um, I don't think we have it broken down by that now, but we can go back and look at that and I can get back with you. And to make it that was 400,000. 400,000. 400,000. 400,000. So yeah, add some, add some more zeros. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. 400,000. That's about a, what, a thousand calls a day? Yeah. 1,100 a day? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, 1095. <laughs> <laughs> Director Ammerman wants to be precise. So 1095 calls a day. That's that's a lot of calls. It is. So Public Safety Director Ammerman, could you come to the podium for me, please? <laughs> I guess you could divide the 400,000 by our budget and that'll tell you what a call costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. But yeah, it's a lot of calls. There's gone up 11%. Like I said earlier, PDs went up 27. Animal control went up like 16%. I think fire last year was like three and a half, but on average they're closer to five. It's busy. And there's more people coming. It ain't slowing down. Mm -hmm. When the infrastructure doesn't get fixed and it's more accidents, then they get even busier. I think the bigger question is how many calls you have to put on hold? <laughs> For PD and fire. That's so just for clarification, 911 doesn't put calls on hold. Thank we you. answer all of our calls immediately. We are one of the few agencies in Metro Atlanta that do not have a recording or a hold message. Mm -hmm. But um, there are some times where we do have to, we run out of fire trucks every day and ambulances every day. So um, the fire department and the PD, they do a really good job of sending their staff over and prioritizing those calls when we're backed up on calls. But that's usually an everyday challenge. And, and I know one of the things that uh, Chief Burnett, that you all added, was that nurse navigator program to help us because I, I don't think people understand the totality of when you're responding to a call I mean, you have to respond to every call, even the stop tow calls, and and you do you all do get those, and then you have a truck that's out, and then you have all your trucks that are out, and then if they're transporting to the hospital, they can't just drop the patient and leave; they have to stay, so they may be on the wall for two hours, where they can't leave the hospital. See, people don't understand all of the processes. They think it's just a, I respond, you take care of it, and then you're back in service. And I think that that's where, you know, a lot of it is lost. And then when, when we don't have trucks to, to respond, then what do we do? Well, he's done a good job of coming up different ways, like the quick response vehicle you're talking about, where the paramedics on that, hopefully, possibly saving them what's having to go uh, to those kind of stub tall calls. And it was like Tamika said, and it was asked about holding calls. We don't really hold them, but we definitely prioritize them. Mm -hmm. If a guy's out or going on his way to a stolen car or a burglary that isn't in progress, that's already happened, and you have crime against a person, yeah, the cop's going to divert and go to the crime in progress or a crime against a person versus going to something stolen. So that may take a little longer to get there, but we do prioritize them. But she doesn't hold them, and we don't not go. It still happens. You know, Atlanta's gotten to the point where 
Mm -hmm. They have an automated system. You get your car stolen, you know, press one, and mm -hmm. then you, you might give the details and it'll generate a report to you. You may never even talk to a human. I mean, we're not, we're not there. Mm. And Chair Harrell, I'm glad you brought up the nurse navigator piece because I think the team, again, has been very strategic in trying to identify other innovative ways for us to provide a higher level of service without having to come to this board and say, we need to increase our property taxes or we need more money. Um, the nurse navigation line, the quick response vehicles, the collaboration amongst the teams, um, just what they've done as a public safety team. And it speaks volumes, again, to the leadership we have, the going after grant opportunities, um, working with our state partners to you know, get funding sources available here so that we can do things that we need to do for our residents. Because you're right, um, when I dial 911, I want somebody to pick up. And yes, we do not, whole calls. We, we may say 911, what's the nature of your emergency, and then we get you moving. Um, but we want to make sure that we are responsive to every call. The one thing I do want to provide clarification on, and I'm going to ask probably Chief Burnett to respond to this when we talk about, because we've said it a couple of times, we're out of ambulances. So Chief Burnett, just for the viewing public, explain what that means. We're not completely out of them, but what that means when we're saying that we may have ambulances that are not available. So. Currently, as it stands right now, we, uh, we run 14 ambulances per day. Uh, and when Tamika means or says that we run out of ambulances, um, at some point during the day, a couple of times, almost every single day, um, those ambulances get tied up, whether they're dispatched to a 911 call, um, so it means they're in route to a call, they are on a call, they are at the hospital, uh, they're out of county on the way back to the county from having to transport somewhere else. Um, but we, we get all of our ambulances tied up. We do, as Director Emery mentioned, we, queue, we have to queue calls sometimes, which means we rate our calls in severity through the 911 dispatch system. So your stumped tow call that, that does come in, that get puts on a lower acuity scale uh, versus you know, a, a severe difficulty breathing or an allergic reaction or a cardiac arrest. Um, those calls get obviously moved to the front. Um, so we have had to come up with challenging ways to respond to some of those things, um, but that, that plate's full. You know, that, that plate's full now, and, and we're kind of going in the opposite direction now, and, and we need to keep up with being able to do what we need to do. Um, and so as, as running out of ambulances, you know, we're not going to not go, as you said, because we absolutely have to go. We just have to prioritize, prioritize sometimes, you know, several times a day, um, which calls we're going to get to first, before we get to the other ones. As he mentioned, it, it might take us you know, 30, 45 minutes, an hour to get to that stump tow call uh, versus that, you know, that cardiac arrest. And, and, and just a, a, I want to pat on the back, I'd be remiss if I didn't and give a shout out to the, to the men and women of the service that we have. We have the highest success rate uh, of what's called return of spontaneous circulation uh, almost in the nation. And what that means is that if you go into a cardiac arrest, you have a better chance of having your life saved in Henry County than almost anywhere else in the nation. That's something to be proud of. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's not because of, of you know, it, it's because of the, the men and women in the field. It's because of the resources that we have out there. It's because of, you know, the ways that, that the staff that has come up with, you know, to face some of these challenges. And that's something that I want to continue to be proud of as an organization. But as we mentioned, the busier and busier we get with those outlier calls, the less time you know, that we have to respond to those calls quickly. Uh, three cardiac arrest calls that have come to me personally within the past week um, that we've saved their life. Uh, and and you know, through all the struggles that you may have and all the challenges, you know, the back and forth like this, uh, those are the little wins for me, you know, when you have, when you have a patient or you have a family member reach out directly to you and say, you know, thanks for doing what you did. Uh, and, and I want those to continue to come in, right? And I want to keep to be able to maintain that level of service and, you know, without adding any additional resources, as the director mentioned, you know, with all the growth that's going on, not only in the county, but all the growth that's going on in the cities that we still have to respond to. You know, I want to keep being able to tap those those men and women on the back and tell them thank you, you know, for, for, for keeping that record for us. But you know, it's it's become a challenge every day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
I just want to make a comment um, because I definitely support our public safety, but I do want to say with Henry County, before I got here, the level of service that you provide to the citizens of Henry County is just superb. Um, I had to encounter you guys once and I was afraid because I've never had an emergency. Um, but when I did, I was just, I mean, it put me in a mindset to know that everything was going to be okay. And so it's not like you take a, you know, pick a person up and just drop them off. You don't have that. And I've seen that um, with other family members in other counties. Um, but the level of service that you provide is just, I mean, you guys deserve everything in my book <coughs> that when you come up here, because you're basically stating these are the things that we need. If we're going to keep this level of service, this is what we need. And I just want you to know that I support you all, and I just want to say thank you for what all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, public safety and uh, Sherry, is it any? Absolutely, Madam uh, Chair. I'm going to ask Ms. Bernita Campbell to go back to the podium. Yes. And we need to go to that executive summary slide that has the major items included um, because I do need to hear from the board in terms of um, what your thoughts are on the pension funding, the insurance increase, the longevity, the COLA, um, the additional $1.3 million for resurfacing for public works. So I'd like to, if at all possible, at least get some feedback from the board. Again, this is a workshop, um, so I'm not asking you all to vote on the items, but these are all items that were previously submitted and then also discussed um, during our board retreat. Okay, so. With so, the exception of Commissioner um, Price. I know he was not okay, a part of that. Right. So I, I guess <laughs> what, yeah, so. go, back to, go back to the slide that you had that information on. Yep. Okay, and so. As part of the the two hundred and fifty nine point seven mil, what you're asking is for these major items to be included as part of the budget, which would be the pension funding, the longevity, the public works funding for resurfacing jail increased inmate medical and food cost, which we don't have a choice in that, uh, countywide technology, and then the 1.6 for all other essential departmental costs and contractional increases in the 1.4 mil uh, debt funding. The debt funding is for what? For all of our, so we currently have our COPS, which yeah. is our Certificate of Participation Grant, I mean loan, not loan, I'm sorry, okay. um, financing that's in place, and so that is our annual okay. debt payment. that's our annual debt. Mm -hmm. debt. Yes, okay. Um, and then Chair Hurrell, also for judicial services, there was an increase for them as well. Okay, then. So these will be all of the major increases from uh, what was um, taken from the various departments uh, with the exception of personnel. That is correct. Okay. And um, you know, I, 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 I guess just my, my thought process is we definitely want to stay on top of all of these issues, especially the pension funding and the longevity uh, for sure because you know, we value our employees and uh, we want to keep them because we fight against the other people in the metro area to get good employees and when you get good employees you want to make sure that we are taking care of them. Uh, resurfacing is huge and um, you know we've had conversations with the sheriff and his staff over there and there's nothing really we can do about medical and food cost increase. Um, I mean, so, Commissioner Wilson, do you have any 
thoughts? I'll just start yeah, with If I you. could get them to break down the pension and the insurance. I got it all in one at 4.3. So we do have a representative from HR here in our insurance team um, just to give a breakdown of the increase that we've received from both Kaiser okay. and from United Health. So, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, um, Ms. Holly LaFontaine will approach. Okay. Come on up, Ms. Holly. Good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners. Um, I have a handout that I can bring to you. The, you the question. Share that? You want to share that with us so, so we yes, can look as we go? And as Ms. LaFontaine is providing that information, um, she'll go over the insurance piece, but Commissioner Wilson, to your question, um, in the slide presentation that Ms. Campbell presented, there is one page that has the budget, and it actually shows the breakdown. I just gotta find the sheet. It's page five. Page five? Mm -hmm. So on page five, I know the print may be a little small to read. It does have the pension number, which is actually the same as last year. We're recommending keeping the same amount um, because we need to make sure that we're including the recommended amount within our pension. So the increase, the number from last year is the same number that we're recommending for this year. And then Holly can speak to the insurance piece and what the difference is between Kaiser and United Healthcare. Okay, thank you. So what I handed you and what I have on the screen here in another print is a tad small, is that there is an approximate 16.8% um, increase in Kaiser coverage. So we have a little over 300 employees that are currently on the Kaiser plan, and the remaining of our coverage is with United Healthcare. The United Healthcare premiums are going to go up um, about 4.88%. So the, the question that, that we have as, as staff is, you know, can we as a county absorb these increases or are we gonna have to pass along some of the increases to our employees? Which again, you know, we, we, we did the class in comp, we got their salaries up. If we eat all of that up with insurance premiums, then they kind of feel like they didn't get much of a raise. And I do have um, Mr. James Ford here. He's with Epic, one of our consultants and our brokers, and he might be able to delve down if you'll have more detailed questions that I don't know, but we're both here to answer any questions. I mean, I mean, it, I, I don't have any questions per se. Does any, anyone, you, Commissioner Wilson, you got the information that you need? I don't, I got everything I need right here. Okay, all right. Yeah, we, we, we don't want to pass the costs on to the, to the employees, at, at least I, I don't, but I think most of the commissioners feel the same way, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Benita, can you go back to your original slide with the breakdown? There we go. Thank you. Um, does any uh, commissioners have any um, questions?
questions or concern about anything else uh, that's on the item included list? Well, Commissioner Wilson, did you have anything else? Other no, than that's all I had. Okay. Thank Commissioner you. Robinson, did you have anything, any questions about anything? Uh, Commissioner Anglin? Uh, no, I, I just, um, I just want to say that I definitely supported the uh, pension funding insurance and the longevity. Um, we need to make sure we take care of our employees. Um, looking at the, the funding for resurfacing, I think you all know how I feel about resurfacing. It's probably not enough money, but you know we have to we have to stay within uh, a boundary. So I understand that. Um, pretty much everything else has, is is just a necessary cost of doing business. So I'm in support. Okay. Um, I guess the, the, the one question that I have is, is I'm going to go, I, I, I know that this does not include positions. That's correct. And so I am going to say what I have to say about this. Uh, we have a lot of vacancies mm -hmm. that we're holding on the books. Mm -hmm. And you have been given directed by the board before that if we don't fill these vacancies by a certain time period, then we're going to have to look at filling vacancies that are needed right now. And I know that the courts have needs. I know that our public safety has needs. I know that all of our department has needs. So as we prioritize the calls that come into 911, I need to prioritize the positions that we need to fill so that these departments can continue to run efficiently and effectively. And so those positions that have not been filled, county manager, you have been told that the positions go away and we start over if we have to uh, so that we can get positions filled. So Madam Chair, I'm glad you brought up the personnel piece and why it was not included or any of the personnel requests were included in this initial budget recommendation um, because Chair Harrell is absolutely correct, as are the other commissioners that we've had numerous conversations with regarding the vacancies that we carry year over year. Um, I believe yesterday when I asked our budget team just for a rough number um, for the vacancies, it's in the tune of about 10 to, 10 to $11 million and that's including with benefits, with the benefits piece. It absolutely makes no sense for us to recommend positions when we're carrying positions on the book. And so what we have been doing um, after the board made it abundantly clear we're not going to give new positions, we need to fill what we have. Um, there are probably quite a few departments that can stand up and raise their hand where they've received an email from HR on my behalf indicating that that position is no longer within their department. Um, we have been very instrumental in transferring some of those positions to our DOT. Um, even on the parks and rec side, we've had Jonathan happily give up some positions to fill some other full-time positions, but we can't continue to carry that, those vacancies, when we know that we have vacancies in other places. And so the staff um, should be very clear that on July 1, when we kick off this new budget, every position goes away. And so what they've tried to do, or at least staff, has been trying to get those positions filled. Um, we have some positions that have been on the books for two years. And I'm of the opinion either you don't need the position or we're not out trying to recruit. And so HR has been working with our staff members to get those positions filled. Um, but I will also say that a large number of the positions are in public safety. And that is because public safety is somewhat of a revolving door. Um, I may have a day where I have 15 vacancies in one department under public safety, but I may have those vacancies as a result of retirements or individuals that may just be transferring to other departments. And so you do see an uptick on that public safety piece, and I think that's one thing that this board has been very clear to me about, leave the public safety positions alone. And so now I'm at a point but I got to do something with those public safety positions. And so um, I've been in conversation with each of our department heads and our public safety cluster lead in terms of what are we going to do with these vacancies that are sitting here for public safety. They're recruiting. Um, we're trying to get people in. Um, but it's not an easy task. And, and I think each of you all know, and probably Chair Harrell more than anyone being on the public safety side, 
it's not an easy job. And so it's, it's once we get individuals in and we get them trained, we've got to figure out how to retain them. And I think passing the class and compensation study has been that tool for us. Um, but I also, I would be remiss, we've talked a lot about public safety. One of the other things that we talked about in our budget workshop meetings with the board as we start preparing the budget packages was those trade positions like HVAC, mechanics, DOT laborers. And so what Holly and her team has been doing since the budget initial um, budget briefings with the board, we've gone back, we've looked at the pay salary or at least the pay rates for those positions. And we will be looking to make some changes um, in this upcoming fiscal year based on the vacancies that we have to make up the difference to try to get some of those salaries up so that we can remain competitive. Um, it hurts me to lose our fleet and our um, um, facility maintenance teams to the school board, any school board, where they can go in and work HVAC at one school and make two times what they're making here. And so those are positions that we're having to revisit again um, to try to get those positions filled. But I, I want to be perfectly honest that a majority of the vacancies are within that public safety arm. And so um, there may be a little pushback. Um, but that's that's where we are in terms of trying to get those positions filled. Thank you. So what do you need from us from this standpoint, Sherry? So we do need to schedule some additional um, conversations with each of the commissioners. Um, I do believe we still have to make a decision on if the board, and it sounds like you all are very supportive of the items that have been included in Ms. Campbell's presentation, but I think we all understand that that would mean we've got to do something with the millage rate or we've got to go back and revisit the initial recommended amount. And I think that's important. Um, I don't want to keep beating it, but I think if Bernita can just go back to that one slide that shows, I think it was page five of the presentation, um, what our original requests, what the recommended requests would be, and what the difference would be needed to make up. And it's that highlighted number at the bottom, that 8.237 would be what our shortfall would be, um, where we would either have to use fund balance or look at some type of millage rate um, increase for that 259.7. And I want to make sure that that's clear to the board if we do proceed with this 259, $259,700,000 um, recommended budget. And Ms. Campbell, if I've misspoken, please you're correct me, jump in. <laughs> no, you're spot on. <laughs> okay. Just need direction of you know, where we're going as to like she said, is it going to be a proposed millage rate increase? Because I do need to begin to post in the Henry Herald um, the next steps. Like, what is our proposed FY25 budget going to be? Okay, thank you. Um, well, we just need to get those meetings set up with the commissioners um, so that any questions, concerns, suggestions, ideas uh, can, you know, be discussed with them uh, before we come back for the May 7th uh, budget hearing. Absolutely. We'll coordinate. Thank you. Thank you. All hearts and minds and clear. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.